Dr. Tracy Shea is a professor in the Department of Psych Psychiatry and Human Behavior, where she directs the Clinical Assessment and Training Unit. She's a staff psychologist at the Post-Traumatic Stress Disorders Clinic at the Providence Veterans Affairs Medical Center. Her research in PTSD includes two studies funded by the Department of Defense concerning veterans of the, the Iraq War, one on PTSD-related anger problems and another examining the early course of PTSD symptoms and predictors of chronic problems. She received her PhD in psychology from Catholic University in 1981. Before coming to Brown, she was chief of the Personality Disorders Program at the National Institute of Mental Health and associate coordinator of the NIMH Treatment of Depression Collaborative Research Program. She's also former president of the North American Society for Psychotherapy Research and former member of the executive board of the International Society for the Study of Personality Disorders. And uh, last and absolutely not least, uh, we've got Senator Senator John Alexander Patterson, who uh, you, you may have noticed was in the movie. <laughs> Senator Patterson's uncle, First Lieutenant Alexander R. Nininger Jr., was a scout, a, a um, member of the Philippine Scouts at the time of his death on January 12, 1942. This connection sparked Senator Patterson's interest in the Philippine Scouts, which were a unit of regular U.S. Army soldiers charged with the defense of the Philippines at the onset of World War II. Senator Patterson worked with Colonel John Olson to found the Philippine Scouts Heritage Society in 1984 with the purpose of preserving the history and legacy of these extraordinary soldiers. Senator Patterson has a long career in the U.S. Agency, of International, in US Agency for International Development, serving in Afghanistan and Africa through the late 80s, and as the Associate Director in the Philippines and Egypt from 1987 to 1993. His education at URI, Trinity College, West Point, and Syracuse University focused on government, history, economics, and public administration. Uh, he was a Rhode Island State Senator from 1996 to 2001, and is also active in local planning and has served as Vice President of the American Foreign Services Association and President of the Philippine Scouts Heritage Society. So, welcome to the panel. Okay, thanks very much. Um, and, you know, I wonder if we could just start off by each of you just taking two or three or even four minutes to say a few words, maybe we could start at the far end, and just a few thoughts of, you know, anything that hits you in the, in the film, and, and particularly, I guess, in relation to your backgrounds. Sure. Yeah. Well, first of all, I just want to say, I'm just really... Um... Oh, maybe pull the microphone in close to you. Okay. Oh, yeah. Is, is it on? There's a green light. Can you hear me? Great. Is that good? Okay. <laughs> thanks. I just wanted to say, I'm just really grateful I had the opportunity to see this remarkable film and hear the stories of these um, remarkable men. And it, my work that's most relevant to this topic is that I you know, treat veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so I have, of course, lots of things um, struck me uh, in watching this film. But I have to say that I think the most striking thing that hit me was that it feels like it's a story of resilience more than post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, it, uh, you know, and it does, it sort of calls for, it just question, it leads you to question like why is it that some people um, are, are so resilient? Um, and often there's also the, the other side which is underneath that resilience, you know, there are other parts that you don't hear about. Um, I think in this film, I found myself wondering what, what else was going on underneath, for sure. But there's no doubt about um, the resilience of, of these men. And I think it, it, in particular, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about this because I see these people and some who just um, are resilient and for some who, who really struggle. and. Um, some of the, there's certainly personal factors, um, but one thing that really struck me about Colonel Olson was um, his sense of who he was and his determination, which kept coming through over and over and over again. And I think that when you're, one is exposed to these kind of circumstances, those are critical factors for getting through it. And I think your mother said that. There's nothing, no new insight here. Um, the other remarkable thing to me, though, was that these circumstances, um, 
you know, some of the things that can help people get through these things are circumstances where you have at least cohesion amongst the people that you're with. Um, you have a sense of purpose and a sense of meaning. You have a sense of recognition. And that was missing for them, despite, I mean, in addition to the life threat and the pain and the suffering and the horror and so forth, um, you know, your father had to keep them disciplined and in control. And they were out fighting for themselves because of the circumstances. And so to me, it makes it all the more remarkable. Um, and clearly, these guys are survivors. Um, they survived the camp, and they lived into their 90s, which yeah. is remarkable. If I can ask something, and I will try not to turn this into a family therapy session for myself, um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but um, I could talk to you for hours about this because our family you know, spent years working on these things. Um, but is there, in the studies of PTSD, is there this sort of correlation with personality traits? Because John Patterson here can talk in detail about what a stubborn bastard this guy, my father, was. Um, is, that a, is there a correlation between the more stubborn people are less susceptible to PTSD? Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I would say stubborn per se, yeah. but it goes along with a whole dimension. Um, personality, some people have called it hardiness. <laughs> um, there's a, another um, way of conceptualizing is that, you know, there's these basic dimensions of personality that one is um, a propensity towards negative affect. Um, another is a propensity. Wait, wait, explain that in detail. Okay, so there's yeah. this concept that's called neuroticism or negative affectivity. Um, and those people are more vulnerable, actually. I don't see stubbornness as part of that dimension. I see it more as um, the, the, um, the sense of, the, the sense of um, in fact, I would think he's low on, on negative affectivity, would be my guess. Um, that, it's, um, there's a, a hardiness factor as well that is a temperamental, I mean, it's part of temperament. I mean, you kind of, I mean, you, you heard it before your father was in the camp. I mean, he said um, that was the determination and the, you know, um, he said, if you, if, if you want to go out with me, I, I call the, the night before, you know, take it or leave it, you know, and if you're going to marry me, tell me tonight, and I'm going you know, so he, he clearly had that temperament um, of being in charge and, in control, you know, managing and um, so forth. So there is research, it's hard to study because typically you don't sort of assess people before they go off and have a trauma, so mm -hmm. it, it, a lot, of, it's hard to research, but there is research that shows that there are these basic personality dimensions that can be protective, although they often get, you know, outweighed by the severity of the trauma exposure and the other circumstances like support that they have around them. So it's obviously multi-layered, wow. multi-factors. Okay, wonderful. Um, and we'll come back around on that. So let's see, um, maybe give us a little bit of historical perspective on things. First, I wanted to thank you. It's an extraordinary film and one that I'm, I'm looking forward to being able to show to, to students at some point. And as I was watching it, there are a couple questions that, that occurred to me again and again. One is, how would this, if, if this was shown in Tokyo, as I hope it is at some point, how would the current generation of, of uh, Japanese historian buffs or others view it? And I would say that there's a tremendous amount of commonality between the way in which this film is framed, the way in which it talks about war memory and about the reception of the war and, and memory of the war uh, in Japan today. Just, and the corollary I think here is not so much uh, Japan's experience with POWs, although there were some primarily in the uh, uh, Soviet Union who came back late, but also the, those, the long-term return of people from the Philippines, right? The guys that came out very late uh, from Guam and others who, who kept coming back and sort of reminding people of the war in some very unusual ways, in ways they were not quite uh, comfortable with. So that, that's one set of questions, is, is how your film correlates with uh, the contemporary construction about understanding of the war in Japan. Um, another set of questions had to do, uh, and I guess these are not questions but observations, were in some ways not so much about your father but about your mother, who also seems extraordinary, extraordinarily resilient and thoughtful and she's at the center of this in a lot. I mean, she, every, the story revolves around her. Uh, in some very interesting uh, ways, and that's unusual. Uh, and another, this is just a series of observations, I guess, is that it's been my experience that uh, with students, and in, in many cases with uh, grown-ups as well, is they like their stories about World War II in particular 
uh, to be simple, to be very straightforward, that you've got black, you've got white, uh, the greatest generation, and your film is one of those that really complicates this. It makes it hard to look back at that and say, okay, I understood, or I understand everything that happened, I understand what went on in the camps and who was good and who was bad. It, it gets very, very hard to do that. And I'm grateful for that because it makes it easier for me uh, to, do, uh, to do my job. You also had some hints in there about the way in which the historical narrative has been constructed around MacArthur uh, and about how he played some of this and that some of the myths uh, surrounding him, the way in which information was controlled during the war and after the war about the role of the POWs and what happened to them is also, I think, an element uh, in this, that people weren't allowed to know uh, for very obvious reasons, both when it was happening and then after the fact. You weren't supposed to talk about this. Uh, and why is that and who does that uh, uh, protect? In this, uh, in this process. And, you know, frankly, I was waiting to hear more from the veterans, and I've seen this in other films uh, and other recollections, of this visceral hatred for the Japanese. And you did get some of that uh, in the film, but not as much as I think has been, that as I was expecting and worried about um, uh, and having to respond to. And I think the range that you saw displayed among those survivors and those veterans is probably more common than the really visceral race hatred or the, uh, the prejudice that you often see uh, in some uh, select veterans. So let me leave it at that and hopefully you have a sure. to come back to those. Yeah, yeah. Um, John, give us some thoughts. Is that okay? Um, when, I f when I first met, well, first of all, it's a great, great film. Thank you. and, and uh, um, I, it filled in a, uh, a number of gaps for me. When we first met in New Orleans, uh, Brandy intimated that there was, there was something about his father that was not widely, widely known. And, uh, and all I could think of at that point was the, the bridge over the River Kwai if you remember the Alec um, Guinness character. Um, and I thought, could that have been John Olson? And indeed, in a, in a certain way, he was. Um, I, I, was I was really um, de devoted to Colonel Olson. Um, he was the... Uh, when my, my uncle arrived in the, in the Philippines just before the war broke out, um, the first meal that he had was, was uh, with, with, uh, with Colonel Olson. Um, so I was obviously drawn to him. And um, were, were you close with your uncle? Or, you know, he, he died died, um, before, yeah, he right. died early in the campaign. And, and by the way, he earned the Medal of Honor, right? Can he you, was awarded the first Medal of Honor yeah. of World War II. Say a couple words about that. Um, young guy, graduated from, from West Point uh, in uh, May of 1941, got to the Philippines on the, the, uh, the um, last troop ship before war broke out, and then he was, he was dead. Uh, he arrived on, on uh, December 5th, I think it was, and uh, was dead on January 12th. Um, he um, uh, was obviously my uh, uh, my inspiration, and uh, and so I uh, uh, the things that I've done um, in in life pertaining to uh, the early days of, of World War II uh, in in the Philippines it is all because of him. Um, created a, a book and manuscript collection at the West Point Library. Um, lots of things have happened that are um, that are in his uh, his name. Um, even when I um, my last Foreign Service post was in the Philippines, and uh, Lily and I went looking for his remains, which were were never found after the war. That's another story um, that that goes on um, goes on today. Um, so Colonel Olson was a real connection with my uncle and therefore everything that, that spun off from that. And um, there wasn't anything I wouldn't do for him. Problem was he was never satisfied. 
<laughs> I mean, you know, I, 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 he wanted me to go down there and help catalog his, his many holdings. Um, he wanted me to go to San Antonio to the museum to work, and uh, and I think you know to be his to be his assistant. And uh, um, uh, it was a you know an interesting relationship. Um, he wanted to make sure that this organization, which was going to honor the Philippine Scouts, had a life. And so, um, you know, this is the guy, one of the few who've, who've written about um, various aspects of, of what took place in the, in the Philippines. And he was exceedingly uh, rigorous about making sure the history was right and that it was correct. And uh, nothing annoyed him more than to, to hear someone say, for example, that those who were captured on Corregidor were in the Bataan Death March. Not, not so. And he would just, he would not tolerate uh, things like that. And let, let so, me ask you, now that you've seen the movie, um, given the title of the movie and the overall portrait that we painted of him, how accurate would you say all that is to the man that you knew? Well, you know, I, this, this aspect of the, of the uh, at the prison, prison camp um, now doesn't surprise me. I mean, I didn't know about it until, mm -hmm. until just now. Uh, but, but, you know, that, that determination, uh, that stubbornness um, is what, uh, as, you, as was uh, said in the movie, saved, um, saved lives. He's been instrumental in, in, in our ability to, to know what, what took place, the good and, and the bad and the ugly. And uh, we, owe him, um, we owe him a lot. And, uh, one, and one of the stories that John told in my interview with him that we couldn't quite, we, there's so much we couldn't pack into the movie, but you, briefly you said that um, he demanded that they let him open a chapter of the Philippine Scouts Heritage Society in San Antonio, and he fought with them. They finally let him open it up. So he opened up the chapter. They had one meeting. He didn't like the way the meeting went, so he closed it like yeah. the next day. <laughs> without, without so much as, uh, you know, a, a word. That's um, my dad. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, anybody want to ask any questions or any comments or anything? Things you're curious? When people ask questions, can you repeat? Sure. Yes. 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 Yeah. yeah. Growing up, uh, if you could talk about your relationship with your father, as well as uh, whether or not you had seen any emotional dip difficulty or, or ghosts or haunt, haunting things within him. Yeah, that's interesting. So asking if I saw really basically any of the evidence of PTSD, I think, to, to some extent, the things that we typically associate with, with that sort of, those sort of symptoms. Um, and that's the strange thing, and you heard my mother even say it in the movie, you know, there, there really was pretty much nothing. Um, and that's why I wonder if that's tied in with, you know, the personality traits with PTSD, that this guy was so stubborn. And I don't think he did suffer a lot of these things. That Even the seven or eight guys that I interviewed and listening to their experiences, and actually, in this wonderful book here, Unbroken by Lauren Hillebrand, it's been a long time bestseller, the story of Louis Zamperini, and she talks in detail about all the flashbacks and things that he had. So we have a pretty clear picture of what went on with a lot of those guys. And as far as I know, I, I didn't see any of it. My mother didn't see any of it. He wasn't abusive to us. He was a grouch, and he was incredibly stubborn in that he just didn't care what any of my friends thought of him when I brought him over, you know, and he'd wear the stupidest of all clothes. He was a family embarrassment. Just everything was just his way. He did not care. So through and through, it was the stubbornness, but um, no, never mean or, or, you know, abusive to us, any of those sorts of things that you would associate with, you know, or shell-shocked or whatever. Um, I, we're all still trying to make sense out of the guy, you know, and he died last October, mm -hmm. and here we are still, like, trying to reason with it. Um, and the funny thing with this movie was that it began with, for a year, I was making a movie that was mostly about my mother because she's such a nice and likable character and so friendly and cinematic, and eventually I recruited the editor, Bob DeMeo, who, you know, is if there's any brilliance in the movie, it's all his work because he just took my materials and um, my previous two movies, you know, we showed here, Flock of Dodos and Sizzle, those were total writer-director things by me where I did everything, controlled it all creatively. But for this one, he almost had to take over, and I, that's why I gave him the co-credit of writing and directing. 
because it got to the point where he was directing as much as I was, and he painted the portrait from a distance. I collected the materials, and so all of the magical moments in there and that little dissolve at the end where it goes to the old black and white photo off of the, the two of them toasting, um, that's all his magic. You know, he's, he was really gifted in that regard. Um, but anyhow, you know, the, the bottom line is I don't know that that was any of that sort of evidence of, of yeah. Can I ask yes. a question about that? Did your, your mother knew him before and then after, right? And she doesn't remark at all in the film about him being transformed by the war in any significant way. Did she ever confide to you or suggest that that? You know, the only little tidbit I can think of that she's ever really told us that when, when he came back and they first got married, um, she remembers him going around the house and closing the curtains all the mm -hmm. time during the day and him saying that, that I never had privacy in prison camp and that's the one thing I want today. And that was, that was maybe one kind of lingering effect mm -hmm. of the war. Um, I guess another thing that we did grow up with is, was his compulsion and obsession with chewing your food. And in fact, um, were, were you the one that told me this? Someone, uh, one of the veterans, I think they had talked with him, he had told many people that part of the reason that he survived and maintained his nutrition was self-discipline, his ability to, to chew these morsels of rice and get every ounce of nutrition out of them as he watched these other prisoners wolf their food down, and a lot of them suffered all kinds of health effects from their inability to, to do those sorts of things. And so we had to sit there around the dinner table and chew and chew and those sorts of things um, that were kind of lingering effects of that. But again, you know, I don't think any of us have any complaints about uh, being abused by our father. We're, there are plenty of them that were, and in fact, I've gotten to know now some of the descendants of these POWs and heard some of their stories, and lots of them are kind of scarred from their upbringing. And in fact, um, I was told by one source that Dick Gordon, who wrote that book, Horio, who helped build the cross, um, that his children, his descendants wanted nothing to do with him, and he wanted nothing to do with his children, and didn't leave anything to them, and, and you know, some of the some of the children, you, you maybe come across some of this, some of the children of these uh, former POWs did suffer from that. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, just to, to add to the, uh, add to the, uh, the reception that these uh, fellows uh, received after the, after the war, they, they were expected to go back to work. I mean, we, we yeah. took care of their par parasites. Um, but we didn't do anything with respect to the to the broken broken minds, and uh, and and so you know what what took place um, is remarkable. And Lillian and I, um, well, you saw in the film Mel Rosen's widow, Olive, yes. uh, lively lively lady, great great fun. Um, but her husband passed away several years ago, <clears throat> Colonel. Um, Colonel Olson, uh, uh, Colonel Rosen, uh, when he got up to make himself uh, a, a cup of tea, he, uh, if there was water still in the kettle, he would not pour it out. He would, he would use it because that amount of water would have kept somebody alive uh, a, bit, a bit longer. Um, so they're just, they're things like that, chewing your yeah. food, uh, not wasting water. I mean, you're the hallmarks of, of the kind of things that, that you run into with these guys. Yeah. Um, you know, can I ask, anybody else want to ask a question? Yes, please. Is this going to be available to see to the general public at some point? Or Let's hope so. Um, I think so eventually. You know, unfortunately, you make these independent films, and then your fate is in the hands of all these other people. Um, we've just begun sending this off to film festivals, and we've heard from two of them, of course, Sundance, it didn't come anywhere close to getting in there, that wasn't a big surprise for us. But without naming this other festival, another festival contacted me just last week, the first other one we've heard from, um, asking me if I would consider removing my mother from the movie, the whole oh, opening geez. part. Yeah. <laughs> I know, and this was from some people that are very consumed with just wanting to hear about military history and like, why is there this lady getting in our way? And, you know, we talked about in the last few days about why is this film here along with my science and environmental films because I'm here to talk about storytelling and I've learned so many of these dynamics in this past two years so much more about storytelling through the making of this film. Um, 
And that's one of the, the things is this idea of literalism. And as much as scientists can get locked on their one little topic, military history guys, as I'm sure you know, can get locked on their one topic of military, yeah. <laughs> nodding your head, yeah, hegemonies, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And some of these guys are so obsessed with their one dimension, they don't want any family dynamics mucking up their movie. But our interest in making this movie, and the whole reason we're sharing our family story here is because that's what broadens it out to a broader audience. And you know, to be blunt about it, it's what makes it uh, of interest to the, to the other gender, to women. And we knew that early on, you know, and with the test screens we had of this, women have broken off in their own little groups to talk about my mother's plight and those sorts of things. Um, and that's really important, and, that, and we really like that about it. But, um, you know, it just becomes sort of different audiences. And so to, to answer your question about the, the fate of it, it's going to take a while, I think. We've got to find just the right film festival that it matches up with, and then hopefully, I, I don't know, you know, it, you would think it would find a, a big receptive audience. Um, after we got that feedback of would you be willing to chop your mother out of the thing, Bob and I just last week got together and sat there and talked for an hour and really gave it serious consider, are we crazy, Bob? And then sitting here watching it again this evening, I not even think about that, you know? Why would you do that? Why would you chop the heart out of it and just make it? The, Discover, uh, the History Channel has done so many of these one-dimensional, all the guys telling their stories, and that's great for one purpose, but this is meant to be looking at multi-dimensions, I think, so, yeah. yeah. Um, you want to mention the reissue of this? Uh, um, yeah, um, so he's got with him my father's three books. And here's another thing that I learned about storytelling that is really, you know, it's so much of the stuff in my father's kind of tragic comic. Um, and I would call this only a semi-loving portrait of my father. Um, you know, I'm not a total fan of so much of this stuff, but I admire his stubbornness and the things that he did. And he did write these three books. He followed through on his word. He, told, he did tell us that, you know, growing up. Someday I'm going to retire and write these books. And he did, and to his credit, he wrote this book, Anderson, uh, O'Donnell, Anderson Villa of the Pacific, and now that you, you've seen the parallel there about how O'Donnell, this horrible mortality rate, um, and he had the, the right instincts as a communicator. He knew that there was this perfect parallel to draw on Andersonville, and I swear, had a brilliant writer written this book, um, you know, had Laura Hillenbrand written this book, Anders, uh, O'Donnell, Anderson Villa of the Pacific, it could have been a bestseller, because his instincts are, are so clear in there, and it's interesting, but, he didn't know how to tell a story, and you saw me in the film battling with him about, you know, tell me some stories. And like, I started off that whole thing, and he, I said, tell me about the day you had to surrender. What went, what went on there? Were you scared? And as soon as I asked that question, he just exploded with anger. What do you mean, was I scared? I don't want to talk about that. I, you know, this is not about talking about emotions. I want to tell you which men were where. And he was very selfless. And your, your comment about um, the narcissism and what you call negative affect, um, you're absolutely right. The guy was not you know, he's got all sorts of shortcomings and, and flaws, but narcissism was not one, and he really was selfless in this regard, and I think that's what you and all these, and when he died last October, I got a ton of emails from all these people wanting to pay their respects, and all these great stories in the emails of reunions, where he sat down, there was one couple, you know, who were like the sons of somebody, and, and he didn't even know him, he sat down, and then just told them for, you know, an hour, all these things that they wanted to know, so he was a major resource, and very selfless in that regard. Um, yeah. So it fits right in with what you're, you're saying. Um, did, did he have um, trouble sometimes? I mean, did, was he able to talk about his experiences with, in, get any, um, did you ever see he, that? You know, he, it's, for starters, once again, he just, he wasn't a good storyteller. And so he wasn't a guy who sat around and told stories that would pull you in. And so even, you know, talking about playing golf or whatever, he wasn't a great storyteller for anything in his life. Um, and so, no, for the most part, he didn't tell us that. And so, just as the movie showed, a um, year ago, last October, I went to that museum in Carlisle and pulled down those boxes, and that's exactly what happened. You know, I started looking at this stuff. Oh, my God, I knew he was in prison camp. None of us really knew he was, I mean, we kind of knew, I guess, he was the commander or something. So, but then I started reading those letters about the men that he had to administer the beatings mm -hmm. to. And that really did kind of resonate, that I do think that he carried that through his whole life, this guilt of what he had to do with his men. And in fact, my older brother has told me that he had a few conversations with him in which he talked about it. You know, it still troubles him to, to this day about that. But he, he only told bits and pieces of stories about being forced to go out and, and march in their underwear in the snow in Osaka mm -hmm. when they were in prison camp and a little bit of that abuse and mostly about the starvation. The other thing I do remember, which I've read in a lot of these other accounts, was this basic rule of 10 that the Japanese used for discipline. They broke the men into groups of 10 with a fundamental rule that if anybody in that 10 tries to escape, they'll kill all 10. And so he had to instill 
discipline on his men to restrain their desire to escape because they'd be you know, jeopardizing all the rest of the men. And I think he, I remember him talking a little bit about that and the, the frustration of that. Um, there's one other dynamic that we didn't quite get in the film, which was that he very quickly taught himself Japanese. Hmm. And that's part of why he got made the commander. And I, maybe I should stick that in there. But um, the other guy, but also the comparison, the previous guy was from the National Guard who wasn't that well disciplined or trained in, in instilling discipline. Whereas at West Point, my father had gotten that. And so, but my older brother told me one little tidbit he'd heard from my father, which was that he ended up walking this fine line where some of the men um, resented him and thought he was conspiring with the Japanese because he'd be over there talking Japanese and all the men start saying, what's he talking about over there? And so he had to deal with that. Um, yeah. It's it's pretty, there's, uh, the stories yeah. go on and on. But, you know, as I was saying before, you. It, it gets overburdening and overbearing sometimes when you start talking with these military guys because the, you know, I think part of the problem is our daily lives are not that interesting compared to war is the ultimate source of tension and conflict and so everything that they do there are these amazing stories and you get saturated where you can't hear too many after a while. Yeah. I mean, and you feel bad that you can't make a film about all these guys. In the movie, several of those guys could be their own movie. Um, the fellow who was the, the cavalry officer, he led the last mm -hmm. cavalry charge of the American, you know, in the history of the cavalry, American on baton. Um, mm -hmm. So was there a Philippine scout? Yes, a Philippine scout. Um, another thought, comment, question? Uh, yes. I don't know if we have my notes uh, answer this question, but when did the military finally drop the gag order on POWs being able to talk about their experiences? And has that possibly had an effect on um, treating PTSD? Uh, okay, okay, that's that's. I should probably comment on it first, and then maybe John's got something to say because I, we've dug in deep on that. And um, so there's a little bit of a debate apparently among. Do you, do you know anything about this issue? Yeah. Okay, so apparently some of the real detailed historians that have dug in on what happened with the POWs, um, there's a debate among them over um, whether there really even was this document that Sutherland forced them to sign, saying they wouldn't talk about their war experiences. Uh, there's a divide between the prisoners that went to Guam. All the Navy and Marines were sent to Guam after they were liberated. All the Army went to um, Manila. And apparently in Guam, a lot of them were forced to sign that. But the reason, I've been told, was to protect um, people who conspired or whatever, like Japanese citizens who conspired to help out and all sorts of things like that so that nobody would get punished after the war for what they did for helping out the American side. So it was more supposedly out of the interest of protecting you know, the guys that were still around. And so several people have kind of rankled to me a little bit about us putting that in there. We talked about it, but the fact is three of these guys that we interviewed talked in detail about being told to sign that thing, which also they claim that document said that they had to swear to remain silent for 50 years. And another dimension of that story was the suggestion that as soon as the war ended, MacArthur was putting in the giant plan there and they needed a ton of money to come pouring in and already in Congress there were battles about, you know, we're trying to recover from the war, we don't want to send money to help the Japanese to repair. And there was a concern that if these POWs came back looking like skeletons and telling horror stories, that would end any possible willingness to do that. And that's part of why, so, so then you get these split motives for why did they have the repo depots, the replacement depots in Manila, um, three of them. And so there is the kind interpretation, which was that they were trying to help these guys get back to health. And then there's the more cynical suggestion, which is that it was trying to get them fattened up before we sent them home so that people wouldn't know those horrors. Uh, you got any thoughts on that? Well, just, just a, a different perspective um, to, your, to your question, I, I think. As time passed after the war, uh, you had people realizing that um, there were there were political dynamics in the Pacific, which weren't favorable to the United States. And of course, in 1949, the, the communists uh, drove the Guomindang over to to Formosa. Um, so it's a fairly small um, time frame, and um, I think. The perception was on the part of some that we needed we needed to keep the Japanese, um, you know, on our side. Um, we needed to uh, ratify a, a treaty um, as quickly as we could, and and um, and sweep under the rug maybe 
too strong a term, but the 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 issue um, the issue of, of the the treatment of the of the of the prisoners um, and what they were told to to do after the war, I think, is is real because I've heard that several times from different different uh, of them t told to be silent. Yeah, right. Yep. Um, and the other part of that is that uh, if a third party came and asked specific questions, I, I found that you'd get answers. But they, they wouldn't volunteer um, much, especially to the families. Uh, I don't know why. Didn't want to embarrass them, didn't, uh, you know, wanted to put it aside and move forward, what, uh, you know, whatever. Um, but time and again, I've run into situations where I've talked to someone uh, and gotten information and, um, and I've been told that by the family they had never heard some of what he told. Yeah, he told and, and I'll, I'll add an interesting tidbit to that, which is that um, one of my professors at USC um, is a fellow named Mark Harris, who's a tremendous guy and has won two Oscars for his documentary features on the Holocaust. And so starting two years ago, I began to go and talk to him. He gave me some great advising on this thing. We had some great conversations about the, the Holocaust versus what went on with these folks. Um, and one of the things he told me about with the Holocaust is that a very clear pattern emerged, which is Holocaust survivors not sharing their stories with the children, yet sharing them with the grandchildren. Yeah. Skip, and that's, skip a that's pretty, yeah, skipping yeah. a generation, that's pretty fascinating, so that's yeah. kind of similar. Yeah. Um, but you know, another thing in the journey of doing this film is getting there down to the primary level of history and seeing how weird it is, to, to how mushy a lot of the stuff gets to be. Even the fact that there's still so much disagreement over how did it end in Japan? What brought on the surrender? Was it the bomb? Was it the Soviets amassing there to come down and take the homeland? Was it the firebombing of Tokyo? And you know, have you, you worked much on that topic? And well, it, it, you're right, it's very complicated. And the usual history is that the, the bombs ended the war. Right. And right. That's, that's a story that the Japanese themselves or the emperor tells his people, right? That announcement on August 15th when he goes on the radio and says, I'm mm -hmm. stopping the war because of the bomb. And there's no indication of what we know, of those, the actual discussions about surrender, that the bomb actually changed anybody's mind about anything. But it was a great reason to end the war, right? That the Americans have this bomb, we don't. The emperor knows that the tide has turned quite clearly, and it's a... <coughs> It's a, a way to explain why he's doing what he's doing. Um, that militarily it doesn't change the balance from their perspective, but politically it's extra, extremely important. And by that point, they'd also had the guarantee from the Americans that, or the implication from the Americans mm -hmm. that there would be no prosecution of him. That the right. imperial line would be allowed to- Which became uh, hugely important, didn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely yes. important. Yeah. Right. Um, and I was thinking too about this, this question of post-war silence about this. I mean, there is, a lot of the POWs are either interviewed or actually asked to testify in both the B and C war crimes trials in Manila or in the Philippines and in elsewhere. And then their testimony is used in the Tokyo war crimes trials as well to go after the systematic or the systemic uh, crimes against humanity and war crimes uh, mm -hmm. for, those, for those trials. So there is some attempt to document and to make the Japanese public aware of what had happened in these places. I was just think, thinking about the psychological effects of that, though, that extra piece, the extra layer of being told that you cannot speak of this. It's almost like you're, it's not supposed to exist. And when you think about the, you know, the impact of that just psychologically, um, and the other piece that they kind of were left, they were abandoned, they, um, mm -hmm. they didn't feel, they didn't get the same feeling of the victory of the war being their own. All those pieces, to me, is also makes it more remarkable that there was, Relatively speaking, not much bitterness there. Um, B bitterness from who? From from the pe the the various people that spoke. The POWs who spoke. Oh, in, in these folks in the film. In the film, yeah. It, it, let's ask him. What do you think about <laughs> the topic of bitterness among the the, the POWs? It it it's a wide wide range of um, yeah of of re, you know reactions, um, but you know <laughs> one of the ways that you can tell about this time frame is that every one of these guys refers to the Japanese as Japs. Yeah. And you, you know, we wouldn't, we, wouldn't do, do, we wouldn't say that now, but it comes, it rolls right off their tongues because that's, that's what, what it was at that time. And, and we had a low, generally a low regard for, um, 
for anyone who was not uh, an American, a white American. Nice. Just the way it was. Amazing. Um, yes. Yes, but to carry on that thought, there seemed to be a special relationship between the Filipinos who were, who were <coughs> not white, whether it's good or bad, uh, and, and the Americans. I'd like you to talk a little bit about the Filipino scouts. Uh, what impressed me so much was their strength and their knowledge as being in the military. Did they carry on after Bataan and, and Corregidor through the Second World so War? So asking about the Philippine scouts and did they carry on as an organized branch of the military? And they were a strange situation because they were paid by the Americans, weren't they? Mm -hmm. And they had American officers and maybe, yeah, you're the expert. <laughs> the, um, it was created, um, uh, the Philippine scouts uh, were, were created essentially um, right after the Spanish-American War. And uh, it, it, it has a, you know, a, a interesting, intricate history, but it, it became, the scouts became over time um, not just the, the protectors of the Philippines, but they were also looked upon uh, by us as a way to um, protect the Philippines, but also to draw down the number of Americans who, um, who were assigned to the Philippines. And you know, you're running through um, history, you're running through the depression, you can imagine the, uh, the various dynamics. But what emerged was 6,000 and then to be 12,000 um, U.S. Army troops, and so you, there's, a, there's a very clear dichotomy here. Um, these, were not, um, these were not Philippine Commonwealth troops. That was separate, the Philippine Army. Philippine scouts were, were regular U.S. Army soldiers um, who, who were long-tenured, highly trained, highly regarded by, uh, by everyone, including, including the American officers. And by the way, there were a few Filipino officers who um, had, had come out of West Point. Um, and the one that comes to mind is um, Alfredo Lim, who, um, who battled the Japanese and wouldn't, wouldn't uh, uh, kowtow to them. And, and so they executed him, I think, in 1943. Um, so, so you have this unit uh, that's highly trained. On the Commonwealth side, we had said to the Philippines, we, we will grant independence in 1946, which is what we did, um, and we'll create, with MacArthur at the head, we'll create this Philippine army of 100,000 troops. And um, it just, it never got really uh, to a point where they were, um, where they were trained, uh, they had poor equipment, um, at times they were, they were badly led, and in the early stages of the war, the, these Filipino Commonwealth troops uh, did not do well at all, but as they were bloodied, from battle to battle uh, in terms of the retreat into uh, Bataan, um, they got better and better. So much so that um, at the surrender, the, the 90, 91st Division Philippine Army, not Scouts, Army, were pulled, um, were pulled together by, uh, by the Japanese and they um, were, were so angry with the, the defense that this division had uh, um, had put up that they executed all the Filipino officers, just shot them, bayoneted them, put them into a, a, a big grave. Um, so I mean, it, there's there's that difference. The scouts, highly professional, um, they along with a lot of others became became guerrillas. Uh, but when the Philippines became uh, independent, then it was an, an anachronism, and and uh, and so the scouts were disbanded, and that's why we're trying so hard through the, I'm gonna put in a plug, <laughs> the Philippine Scouts Heritage Society uh, to make sure that their memory and their exploits are, are, uh, are never forgotten. And, and, and Dave, who I, who I know from Rotary in North Kingstown, if you'd like to know more, I'm happy to give you a website reference and I can give you some materials and, and uh, have a good time.
And, and I'll say, um, you know, everyone I interviewed of these veterans, they just, I mean, you could see it. They just raved about the scouts and their discipline. And in fact, there was a story early on there, Dan Crowley, the wild man in the yellow t-shirt, he told that story about going down that jungle road, the first encounter they had with the Japanese. They went out there, they thought it was 100, it turned out there were 5,000 there. We didn't stick in the other half of that story, which is, he said, we did the smart thing. We all turned tail and ran as fast as we could back up this road. But as we were finally getting further up the road, a whole division or whatever of the Philippine scouts came by and he said, uh, and they all called him Joe. And he said, I remember they said, you know, don't worry, Joe, we'll take care of them. And he said, we heard him go down there. We heard all the gunfire. The next day we went out there and the Japanese were just all over the beach dead. And the Philippine scouts were all sitting around cleaning their weapons. So uh, yeah, everybody was in awe of them. Um, let's see, maybe one like John Sturman, you have to say something because my friend John Sturman was there two years ago when this whole project started um, in Wichita, Kansas, when we had my mother and I gave a talk to a local group there and he just happened to be in Wichita as well. So uh, you got one thought or comment or anything? Well, it was, it was great and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, there's a lot of questions I, I could ask, so I don't want to take a lot of time, but uh, I'm wondering if um, our psychiatry colleague could comment at all about what differences there might be today in the care and the diagnosis and the care that our returning soldiers are, are getting and whether you think it's going to matter. You know, it's just... And then, let me repeat that. So he asked uh, if she could comment on today's soldiers returning um, in their treatment for PTSD and whether she thinks it will matter. You know, it's a great question, and I wish I had a simple answer to it, because I don't, but it's remarkably different, of course. It, at the time of World War II, the, the thinking was that um, people who had symptoms, men who had symptoms after the war, it was because they had a weak character. I mean, that was the belief. So it's gone from that to a recognition that this is a valid disorder that many people develop, um, and it's real, and it doesn't, it, it doesn't just afflict the weak. It, it, people it affects people who are strong and grounded as well. So, um, and there's more awareness of it. Of course, the Vietnam veterans um, uh, had a double layer of, first of all, people not recognizing it or understanding it, um, and also being blamed for the war. Um, so they had, I, I, you know, use that sort of, may sound like cliche, but the secondary trauma, which was very important, that they could not talk about it. Um, the World War II folks, I think they chose not to talk about it, by and large. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's multiple reasons probably for that. But um, the current, you know, so, so this, these more recent wars is, is the first time, really, that there has been a lot of attention to the effects of war um, and on post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and there's a real push to, to, to try to offer treatment, have treatments. We've had advances in treatments. And I remember, because I had worked with Vietnam vets for years, and when this war broke out and people started coming back, I felt this urgency t that they would get into treatment because I had worked with so many Vietnam vets who hadn't had any treatment, and their lives became a wreck because they had to stuff it, they were blamed, they then turned to substance abuse, horrible, horrible stuff. And um, so I felt this urgency, and there was this sense like, oh, if we can just get them in early, you know. But, and to, some and to some extent, I think that is true. And we've all had experiences where people have responded well. Um, but it's still striking to me, regardless of all this, um, you know, attention and recognition, how so many of them struggle with reintegration that to, the, the gap or the distance between the civilians who, you know, haven't been there, and there's a very strong perception, which is fairly accurate, that people back here are just living their lives, and, you know, it's not a joint thing like World War II was. I mean, World War II was much more, the country was involved. Mm -hmm. um, whereas now, you know, they go off and they, you know, they come back, and um, people seem to more interested and they care, but they feel a separation, like at least, you know, and I have to qualify this because I see the people who are having trouble. <laughs> so, you know, the ones who don't come, some of them are not having these issues, but it has been striking to me how hard it is, despite the public awareness for them to reintegrate, that there's something about um, being in war, fighting in war, some things they see, the things they do that um, can create a division that's very hard to, overcome. 
Um, so I think the verdict is still out. I think they are benefiting from public awareness and from um, treatment, but it's still striking to me. It's, it, it's, it's still a struggle for many of them. And of course, the thing that's complex in this story is that these folks suffered not just combat PTSD, but then also the psychology of being a POW. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten to know, you know a bit about that in making this film. And I think one of the more profound moments in the film was when uh, Nicole Galbraith says about his father, my father, and Wainwright, they all lost their war. And that hit me hard when he said that. And I tried to develop that in a little bit in there using my grandfather as the, the contrast, you know, that he and MacArthur and Sutherland got to come back and yeah. celebrate. They were the war heroes. And mm -hmm. when you think in terms of narrative structure, I mean, this is simply we cheer for winners and I don't yeah. know what these POW guys are. I liken it to like being on the football team and you got injured at the beginning of the season and you had to spend the whole season on the sideline and you won the championship, but do you really get to celebrate with the team? And I think that when the liberation happened and all this victory stuff, they were mostly yeah. emotionally confused. You know, do we get to celebrate? We didn't do anything in this war. So yeah. in the simplest of all principles, and I gotta say, it's kind of sad. You go to the National Prisoner of War Museum in Andersonville, Georgia, and it's not much of a place of celebration. You know, it's just, it's a bit like the Vietnam War Memorial, you know, where the psyche is, what, how do we exactly deal with this? And it's, it's just tough compared to like the National well, World War II Museum in uh, Louis in New Orleans, which is a place of great celebration. So that's all psychology, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, very complex. Yeah. Um, should we do one, any, one last little thought question? Uh, yes. Uh, I have to say, having read Unbroken, I, I was so shocked that I didn't know that story at all, the whole POW. I thought everyone was Geneva Convention. I, I couldn't believe that part about, you know, the atrocities um, and all of that. But the other point is um, Louis Zamperini, who I believe is still alive today, yes. and, you know, having not only survived the POW camp, but the, um, you know, the, uh, uh, being a survivor on the ocean, you know, after. Yeah, and, and by the way, um, he and my father were in the same camp at the end of the war. Um, in this book, he tells about a group came in from Osaka, and yes, so the last yes. few months that my father was in that group. Right? And what was amazing to me is that his PTSD lasted so long, because your first inclination is to think, well, he survived all this. He's so strong. How can he let this affect him so much and his was more obvious because he was an alcoholic and you know all of that so and he lived he obviously if he's still alive I think he must be 97 or something so you're thinking wow you know he, he did come out of it well you know it's so like, funny to hear you say that because I'm halfway through that book <laughs> and I didn't you know I saw so I didn't know that I didn't know that's how he ends up so he's still in the Spoiler camp alert. where I am so <laughs> Whoops. it's like uh, yeah, because uh, the book know, is unbelievable. It, I mean, it's, it's truly amazing. It you just shake your head all the way yeah. through it. And it's it's yeah. all it's being made into a movie. I understand, and I think that is going to certainly um, hmm. get this story. You're talking about storytellers, yes. how powerful they are. Because it's not just having the experience; it's being able to recount it and in, in such a way that you, yes. you know, bring people in. But. Louis Zamperino was always a writer. He kept journals and little mm -hmm. diaries everywhere because the detail in that book is yes. amazing. Yeah. So it, it's, also, it's also a love story, isn't it? And he, you know, he, he survives, he, he, he goes down, his wife sticks with him. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's, very, it, it's poignant, um, it's brutal. Uh, if you want to know about the treatment, um, of, a, of an American by, by the Japanese um, and, and also enjoy a, a bestseller and extremely readable uh, piece. That's Unbroken's the book. Yeah, um, it's truly amazing. Um, and you know, actually talk about the, the ruthless behavior. At one point with this film, I sent an email to Bob the editor and I said, you know, we have to put the one story in there that really kind of crosses the line. Um, and it's the story that Frank Knapp tells and he just passed away last fall and his daughter sort of told me that this story was the one story I think he really wanted to get committed somewhere and that's the story he told about the the Filipinos that were strung up by their thumbs and then beaten to death and with the sticks yeah. rammed up them and you know he just and it was so interesting because I did that interview with him and it was about an hour and we finished 
And he kept talking and seemed like he'd gotten everything out. And then my cameraman was wrapping things up and I kind of was giving him signals, you know, don't, don't set the, the stuff off let, yet. And he finally came around that story and then we turned the camera back on and then he poured that whole thing out. And um, I mean, that's just horrific, you know, and I just felt like it had to be in there to really show the extremes of what went on. It was so bad. So anyhow, um, should we probably, Yeah, well, thank you guys. Those are wonderful perspective from all of you. And um, thank you guys for coming to the screening. And it will have, uh, I think, a pretty big life. It's going to take a while to get it at the right film festival. But, um, you know, just keep an eye on Colonel Stubborn. And, um, yeah, you know, um, um, crazy journey. Yeah. Right. So let us know how it goes. Yes, absolutely. Um, and if anybody wants to ask more questions, we'll stick around for a little while here. So thank you all very much. Yeah. Great. <laughs>